Hello, welcome to Truth Sentinel, watching over the truth in the news. Today's date is 28th of September 2014. Welcome to any new listeners and thanks for your support for people who've been listening for a while. Currently in Odessa, Ukraine, where the atmosphere is um, pretty good considering there's a war going on in the east still, although there is a ceasefire at the moment. Um, basically, it's a fairly good holiday kind of atmosphere at the moment, um, very different to how it was when I was here some months ago and there was people being shot in the centre and people burning to death in one of the government buildings. Everything's fine where I am at the moment anyway. Today's news. Um, so I just wanted to say about the Scottish referendum where um, they voted no. I mean, there are some allegations of vote rigging with some video evidence. Um, but really, I think it's more of a question of successful media manipulation and mind control. Uh, again, with people uh, being scared to take a risk on the unknown. And um, it's a bit of a shame, but there you go. I, w I would have been surprised if they'd been allowed to get away with it, to be honest. But, you know, I, at the end of the day, it's not over. If people, you know, people think you, we have to vote and uh, go along with it. Actually, if the majority of people in Scotland want to be independent, it's not too late. This isn't a want that wasn't a once in a lifetime opportunity. People can just take to the streets. I'm not advocating violence. I'm talking about peaceful protest. You know, if millions and millions of people take to the street, there will be a visual display of, of um, support for independence. And at the end of the day, when the people rise up, there's not much they can do. So I think it's still not the end of it anyway. If you want to be independent, Scotland, go for it. Now, talking of rising up, we have the, uh, the leader of Hong Kong's Occupy Central pro-democracy movement um, announcing the launch of a mass disobedience campaign and um, thousands have gathered outside government headquarters in central Hong Kong. Uh, there was arrest of 60 protesters who entered a restricted area uh, previously and students and activists opposing Beijing's decision to rule out democratic elections in Hong Kong in 2017 are unhappy and there's lots and lots of young people um, supporting that and uh, blockading the heart of Hong Kong's financial centre. Uh, ISIS news, US-led coalition airstrikes have hit Islamic State targets, um, allegedly, the Pentagon says. Uh, an IS building two armed vehicles were destroyed at the Cobain border crossing. This was announced by the US Central Command and there's been um, talk of other sh targets being hit elsewhere in Syria and northern Iraq. Seems to me like um, basically they wanted a war and they they have plans for certain wars in Syria, Iraq and other countries and when they try to get public support which they prefer to do to, to um, avoid unrest uh, they, they try to do it with the chemical weapons allegations in Syria that failed and so this was just that it doesn't bother them too much they've always got a plan b and this was their plan b they've they've, they've actually created a lot of support for attacking isis now um, and there's already been reports of children being killed in these airstrikes whether you agree or disagree with um, the airstrikes against isis in iraq it's been proven that it doesn't work I mean, what, what's the difference between what happened before in Iraq? They, they've just created a massive mess. Yeah? And instead of looking at these uh, options as solutions, they need to find out the root cause of not just problems in the Middle East, but problems in the entire world. And really, that means we need them to all step down because they're not capable of solving these problems because they don't have the correct mindset. They, they come from an elite background with business um, business agendas and really no understanding of what it's like to suffer or to, to worry about where your money's going to come from for your next meal or for travel. People in um, normal people have experienced that.
not everyone. I mean, it's. I'm not saying it's. Um, it's wrong to have lived a life where you know you your family had supplied for you. That's fine. But these people have had an overprivileged life. They've gone to private schools. They've never had to worry about money, and their futures are almost guaranteed. We need to get those people out. They're not the kind of people that make the best decisions for society and for the world. Let's talk a, a bit about Ukraine since I'm here. The EU's energy commissioner is hopeful of a deal between Ukraine and Russia to end their dispute over gas deliveries. Um, and th there's talks going on in Berlin. And um, I'm going to try and do a bit more research into the Ukraine situation and maybe link up with Pete Wicker again soon and talk about Ukraine as well, what's going on here and where it's going to end. I mean, there were fears at one point this was going to lead to World War Three. Who knows? Um, it's um, it's there's a relatively quiet period, at least there seems to be. Whether there actually is in East Ukraine, I'm sure there's still people being uh, killed and places still being blown up, as we saw with um, an explosion um, that was reported uh, last week which some said were tactical nuclear weapons being used. I don't know about that personally, but it didn't really look as big enough to be a tactical nuclear weapon to me. Um, more videos of cops shooting people from the US um, seem to be very trigger happy, the cops over there. There was a, I don't know if you've seen the video of um, a guy at a petrol station, completely innocent, pulls up at the petrol station and a policeman asked to see his license. Well, number one, why is he actually asking to see someone's license anyway when the guy's done nothing wrong? I mean, he's just gone to get some fuel. So there's the first mistake. Second mistake, he asked him to get his license. When the guy eagerly goes to get it, uh, too fast, uh, too fast for the police because they're like, no, you've got to move slowly around them. But he eagerly goes to get his license, which is on the seat in his vehicle. And so the, the officer just shoots him repeatedly. The guy is lucky to be alive. Um, fortunately for him, the, the cop wasn't that good a shot and only hit him once. But, you know, it's just, it's just crazy. This mentality that uh, the police have in the US um, needs to stop where they think they can just shoot you if, you if they think there's any kind of threat. When most of the time there isn't. I saw another video of a guy told to get out of his vehicle and put his hands up, which is exactly what he did, and he gets shot anyway. And uh, I think the excuse was given more, he might have had a knife. Well, the police were at least 10, 20 meters away, so there's not a threat there. Not unless the guy's like one of those expert ninja knife throwers, you know. Okay, um, I also wanted to talk about how... Uh, voicemail service. I want to try to encourage people to use that. It's like a basic like a phone in feature. So because I, I want to have more interaction uh, with the audience here that's listening. So um, I'm going to put a little video up on this um, this video showing how to use the voicemail service. So you can just leave a one and a half minute message to show your views on something that's happening around the world or something we talk about on the show and you leave your one and a half minute um, comment and it gets put on the show and then I'll, I will respond to all your comments. I believe we've had one in today so let's go and listen to that now. Hi Scott, it's Ron here, just trying out your new voicemail system um, and wanted to drop you a message about Ebola and the conspiracy theory that's the Bilderberg group actually behind it and they're certainly involved with the the vaccines that are being created and uh, there was in the meeting this year in 2014 the Bilderberg Group there's, there was uh, a number of people from the pharmaceutical industry wondered if you knew about this and what your take on it was. Cheers, bye. So thanks Ron for doing that. Uh, the voicemail services for listeners and guests, previous guests that have been on the show that want to just keep in contact and that sounds like it was Ron, our researcher from Celebrity Deaths episode. He brought up an important topic um, the Ebola virus and what it means for everyone and it's links to Bilderberg and others who want to reduce population levels and there are direct links I'm not just scaremongering here I've been looking into this um, 
So at the 2014 Copenhagen Bilderberg Group meeting, there was lots of biochemists, doctors and pharmaceutical heads attending this secret meeting. Also, there was um, Kasim Reed, the mayor of Atlanta, who oversaw two American missionaries bought, being brought back from Africa and cured with a miracle vaccine. There's, there's a lot of links um, to various groups and things. And I just think something is going on now quite what it is. Let's we can ha we can just only speculate and investigate at the moment how bad it, it, it could be. But something's going on and I don't think it's good. Um, I mean, is this the killer virus that the elite have planned for us all? I don't know. But let's let's look at what um, let's just to do a little bit of investigation together. So um, I'm just going to go through some information and maybe we'll come across some things. I know we will actually because um, I've already come across some things. So Ebola is a human disease and other primates can, are also affected by the Ebola virus. The symptoms start two days to three weeks after contracting the virus. Uh, you get like a fever, sore throat, muscle pain, headaches, uh, also vomiting, diarrhea and a rash. Um, decreased function of the liver and kidneys and people can begin to bleed within the body and externally and if you look at some of the pictures of e Ebola victims it's not a pretty sight um, it does look like something out of a um, zombie apocalyptic movie or series um, have a look on the internet have a look at pictures of uh, Ebola victims it doesn't look like the kind of disease you want to uh, you want to contract. I mean, of course, we don't want to contract diseases, but it looks pretty nasty. Put it that way. I mean, human to human transmission can occur with direct contact with blood or bodily fluids. So it sounds a bit like AIDS in that way um, from an infect infected person. There's been a lot of cases of um, people contracting it during the funerals of other people who've been uh, killed by the virus so there's obviously uh, hygiene is essential uh, particularly looking after the care of needles and syringes as within AIDS um, okay let's look about the origins of the Ebola virus I think it has connections to the Marburg virus um, which uh, occurred I believe in the 70s and the first case of the actual Ebola strain of this virus was in 1976. And I, I found some connections with the World Wildlife Fund, World Health Organizations. Um, I don't mean necessarily direct um, connections. I'm just talking connections with people. Basically, the group's mission of the World Wildlife Fund was set up to stop the degradation of the planet's natural environment and to build a future in which humans live in harmony with nature. Prince Philip, um, being the one of the proponents of this and actually directly connected with the World Wildlife Fund up until the late 90s, I believe. But he still does a lot of work for the World Wildlife Fund. Uh, he's a big conserva conservationist now. There's nothing wrong with that, of course, but there's a dark side to con conservation. Um, and it all stems from, for me, it sort of stems from the estate management, which Prince Philip will be very familiar with, you know, managing a large estate, managing the animals on that estate, uh, animals such as deer and badgers, and, and culling them if necessary when they feel that it's not um, benefiting them or other um, animals or species or plants in that environment. And um, Copenhagen seems to crop up a lot, I think, because it was uh, it was uh, this year or last year when a uh, there was a headline of a giraffe, a young giraffe being killed actually killed in front of children as well as a kind of study um, because they felt it was in the it was in the benefit of the the giraffe gene pool to kill this giraffe a completely healthy giraffe and uh, Copenhagen Zoo came under a lot of attacks um, 
verbal attacks from people for doing this, and rightly so, I believe. There was nothing wrong with this giraffe. It's perfectly healthy. They believed, oh, no, no, it's in the best interest of all future giraffes to just brutally kill this giraffe. And then to do it in front of animals, uh, sorry, <laughs> to do it in front of children um, as a form of education for the future as well. And just to let people know this is perfectly normal. So culling is a big thing amongst the elite, you know, and, you know, uh, fox hunting, things like that. It's always been something that um, the elite have been interested in. And one thing I wanted to say about Prince Philip is, um, you know, you may be familiar with, if you type in Prince Philip and um, population control, you'll come up with a video of Prince Philip openly saying that population control is necessary. And um, in fact, on one in one case in 1983, Philip um, Prince Philip chastised, chastised aid workers and charities for helping to treat victims in Sri Lanka. Um, he was basically saying that the best intentioned aid programs are actually helping increase the population by stopping natural diseases like malaria um, and you know I guess he'd probably say the same about the Ebola virus this is just nature trying to cull the population if you if you actually start protecting uh, humans or you know giving them giving them any kind of protection um, then or helping them you know uh, then you're actually doing a bad thing there yeah. because it's much better for humanity to die out I mean he he actually did say he'd like to come back as a virus and exterminate humanity and I think this is the problem now some of you may th think that there is a population problem I don't actually think there is <laughs> there really isn't there's plenty of uh, there's definitely not a land mass problem there's you know there's there's vast areas of the world that are unpopulated some of them uh, maybe because it's desert or um, it's too cold but you know even uh, even if you discount that there's still vast vast areas of land still unpopulated and I think with the deserts and the cold areas as well we have technology these days we could live anywhere you know uh, because we you know we can control the temperature in uh, by in in buildings so it's not really a problem um, I think it's a problem of distribution of wealth, distribution of resources, and that's due to the mismanagement of our world leaders. So they're the problem. And the solution they're trying to propose is a solution to a problem they perceive as too many people. But it's not, that's not the problem. Let me know what you think about that anyway. That's just my opinion. Um, Okay, so let's just move on. So basically, uh, uh, Prince Philip is connected to the World Wildlife Fund, who have lots of offshoot organisations as well. As, as well, and um, they have a you know have tropical rainforest ca forest campaigns, um, and they have um, another organisation called the Traffic Conservation Program, which um, basically helps ensure the trade in wild plants and animals is not a threat to the conservation of nature and i think we're going to be talking about this later about the the love of nature and i of course love nature um, especially in our technological age you know um, when i spend way too much time on uh, with technology on the internet i just love walking amongst nature but i think there's a, also another agenda of making people love the planet and love nature more than actually loving each other. And I think that's the priority, you know, first, we should actually start loving each other and not think of each other as a, a disease or a virus. We're not. Um, it's only the worst people that maybe you could say were a disease and a, a virus. And um, the worst people are uh, sort of psychopaths and people who are, you know, bring in war and destruction upon the earth. Those those people could be seen as a virus. Now, you probably know many, you have probably have many friends and people around you, and uh, I don't think you'd think of them as part of the problem. It seems to me the people who are the problem are the ones who are actually trying to control it and acting like gods, you know, and uh, advocating the culling of uh, populations, basically, as well. And they don't just, just do it with humans, they do it with animals, so we can see the evidence there. Okay, so let's move on to talk about, um, 
I just also wanted to mention that Prince Bernard, uh, the Bilderberg of fa the Bilderberg founder, um, is also connected to the World Wildlife Fund. Uh, founded the 1001 Club in 1970 with the aim of raising funds for the World Wildlife Fund, and he was the first chairman, uh, and uh, along with Julian Huxley, uh, eugenicist, uh, was also a founding father. So back to Ebola, um, in 40 to 50% of cases, bleeding from puncture sites and mucous membranes, uh, that's, so that's sort of around the nose and gums and areas like that, has been reported. Um, the bleeding typically begins five to seven days after the first symptoms. And sufferers can cough up blood, vomit, or um, obviously diarrhea as well. The disease has a high risk of death, killing between 50 and 90% of those infected with the virus. As I mentioned before, Prince Philip has talked of coming back as a virus and um, sort of helping depopulate the earth, culling, and um, maybe they've decided to do it before he dies as a, some kind of sort of present. I mean, the Georgia Guidestones, which you may or may not be familiar with, if you're not, just look it up on um, the internet. It has um, a new 2014 block added, so have a look at that. So there's a, a small block that's been added to these strange guide stones which talk of cutting the Earth's population down by over 90%. And uh, there's a new block added that says 20 on one side of the a block and 14. Is it some kind of... Uh, symbolic gesture to say that this is the year where it's all going to start. Type in Georgia Guidestones basically and check that out yourself. A lot of the stuff that I talk about you need to do your own research um, because it would just take up too much time to talk about it. I mean there's definitely something going on with those Georgia Guidestones. They they must have cost a fair amount to make and they're, they're being updated and monitored so it seems to me like um, what they're designed for is for groups such as the World Wildlife Fund or uh, and the people connected to it and Bilderberg. Sorry, I'm not I'm not saying the World Wildlife Fund is all bad, by the way. Um, just to make that clear, I'm talking about some of the people who are involved with the World Wildlife Fund and um, the World Health Organization. Some people, I'm sure, who work for them are fine, and you know, people may have donated to them. Fine. But there's, there's people at the top that um, have different agendas. It's the same with the UN. There's a lot of people working for the UN who are fine. Um, but there's a lot of people who aren't. And it's usually the people at the top. It's the same with society, basically. There's a lot of good people in society, but the people at the top aren't necessarily as good. Okay, um, so moving on. I've mentioned I don't believe there is a population problem. I believe there's a distribution problem, distribution of wealth being one of the main problems. I mean, if you look at Prince Philip and the royal family, it they get a crazy amount of money from the actual population of the UK, uh, mostly complicit. And there's another example of mind control, media manipulation. I mean, Clarence House is the royal family's PR agency that control all the information that gets released to the press and they have people working amongst the press so it's no wonder a lot of the population in the UK think giving part of their salary to make um, the royal family rich beyond anyone else's wildest imagination so they can wear different clothes every time they're seen in public they have all the finest foods they're ever going to need of course if there is an Ebola virus which uh, does kill um, large section of society, it's not going to affect them. They'll be given um, protection, they'll be given vaccines, they'll be given uh, antidotes if they did unfortunately catch it. Um, but, I mean, whether this virus is the virus that's uh, been designed to wipe out humanity, um, or whether it's just a virus that's been introduced to make money from vaccines, from antidotes, or whether it's in a trial run of a, a, or an experiment for a, a larger one that's coming later, I don't know. But I do know that if you look into the past of Ebola, which was named after a river in 
in uh, Africa, basically in the Congo, I believe, in 1976. Basically, you can see that there was a lot of organizations around then that started up. I believe that that society that I mentioned, the the traffic conservation program, looking after the the trafficking of plants and um, and wild plants and animals uh, was set up in 1976 where the first case of Ebola was discovered. Uh, there was much, uh, there was other outbreaks in 1995 when 250 people died. But as I mentioned before, it's also strange that the the worst case of the Ebola virus happened obviously this year, 2014, the same year that the vaccines and antidotes uh, seem to be made ready by, uh, started by a company whose name I've forgotten at the moment in 2007 and um, managed to finish their production of this, um, this, the viruses and antidotes all ready for the worst ever outbreak. And you know, I don't think they, there even has to be a massive outbreak um, internationally. There just has to be one or two cases and then they just roll out all these expensive um, vaccines and uh, antidotes and charge millions. I believe the company that made the, uh, one of the companies that made the antidote is, has already been given millions of fund, millions of pounds of funding. Anyway, that's what I think about the Ebola virus so far. Um, just a round up of last episode, we talked to Jasvinda Sangira about honor killings. Hope you had a chance to uh, catch that episode so, as it's a very serious issue, not just honor killings, but forced marriages as well. I mean, there's a lot of issues. And I just want to tackle them on these programs to you don't have to agree with everything I say or, you know, or agree with my political stance, but we can still disagree on some topics, but still agree that killing people uh, to protect a family's honor or forcing someone to marry uh, someone is is at least something we can agree is wrong. As I mentioned, I'll be linking up again with Pete Wickert soon. The truth is stranger than fiction. Catch out his show on YouTube. Uh, just type that in on YouTube. Truth is stranger than fiction with Pete Wickert. We'll be contacting him soon to do a, another show from Ukraine, talk about Ukraine situation and other world events. Today we're going to be joined by Sheila Zelinsky. Now she's the host of Weekend Vigilante. Some of you may have know her from the Hagman and Hagman show. And um, the Weekend Vigilante and some of the shows she's doing are, the, are some of the fastest growing shows in alternative media. And they look at um, a lot of important um, topics. And um, she's sort of been compared to like a female Alex Jones. And she, look, they, she looks at the New World Order, totalitarianism, I'm glad I said that properly, um, tyranny, uh, erosion of freedoms, liberties. And she looks at things from a Christian uh, angle as well with Hagman and Hagman. This is very much a, a Christian perspective on some of the things that are going on. And we like to look at all perspectives. I like to look at all perspectives on this show. Uh, you know, we've, had, we've talked about atheism. We've talked about um, Christianity before. We've talked about, um, you know, we, we, we cover topics that deal with uh, the Muslim issue on Islam. And um, I want to bring as many different people with different viewpoints on so that even if you disagree with them, we can all at least understand uh, everything and at least try to get along, you know. She, um, anyway, Sheila also wages war against establishment corruption. Uh, so, you know, I think we try and do that on this show as well. Corporate fascism, eugenics, um, which we've just been talking a little bit about. Martial law, the encroaching draconian police state, which is happening um, in a different way in the UK, I believe, as well. You know, like I think I mentioned before about protesters being arrested uh, before the G8 summit had even started. You know, and uh, today we're going to talk about revelations and climate change, amongst other things. Um, so we'll be t talking uh, when it when it comes to revelations. A lot of people think about um, six six six, the Antichrist, Mark of the Beach, um, Mark of the Beach. You can tell what I'm thinking about. I'm thinking about my next holiday. 
Um, I mean, I'm hearing Odessa near the beach as well, so that's probably why I said that. So, sorry, Mark of the Beast, uh, Wormwood. Um, anyone who hasn't read Revelations, the light, final book of the Bible, uh, there's a star which is supposed to fall from the heavens. And uh, a lot of people believe that Revela Revelations is a prophetic book which talks about future, what's going to happen in the future and in the end times. And um, a lot of Christians believe we're in the end times at the moment. And we're going to be talking about that, you know, Armageddon. Uh, Geddon, I believe, being a place um, in on the outskirts of Israel where a lot of people believe the final battle of Armageddon is going to take place. As I've mentioned before, whether you believe this is going to happen may not be that important because whether you believe it uh, or not, um, some people do believe it and even some people in power, um, some of the world leaders believe it and some people believe they're going to try and orchestrate it anyway. Uh, obviously, if you're a Christian, you may believe this is going to happen due to prof uh, prophecy in Revelations. But certainly, you, you can at least say that um, in Revelations, it talks of things which do appear to be happening. Um, so have a ch if you're not Christian, go and read Revelations and um, read about uh, the interpretation of it, because there's a lot of symbolism in there. But most people um, who study the book of Revelations will talk about, uh, some of it's quite clear, they'll, they'll talk about um, peace treaties being signed in the Middle East, um, you know, and that, that's been being talked about for, for many years, um, talks about Israel becoming a nation which happened in 1948. And um, some people say that, um, that basically as Israel became a um, nation in 1948, a generation will not pass until these events that are prophesied in Revelations will come to pass. And certainly, you know, you could, some people believe this um, 666 uh, Antichrist will, will ask people to take a, a sign or a symbol on their um, forehead or hand. I believe, I believe it's the right hand which they won't be able to buy or sell without. Now, that's not so far away, I think. You know, I mean, people talk about the RFID chip or a barcode on your forehead or hand. Certainly, I, I when I arrived in the airport in London, um, last time I came back from Ukraine, um, I, my face was scanned. I think it was a facial recognition system, but it certainly made me go through the queue quicker. And I think a lot of these things you know, if, if you weren't able to buy any food or sell or travel, if you unless you had this chip implanted on the skin, and it might just be a quick injection, completely painless. Would you stand up to that or, or, or would you take this mark? I think you'll find most Christians won't take the mark. Um, or at least people will have to choose whether they're going to take this mark. What about you? Let me know via the, the voicemail system that I told you about earlier. What, what what's, what's your opinion of of um, first of all revelations and things like the mark of the beast but we're going to talk about that with Sheila Zielinski we're also going to talk a little bit about climate change which will be quite a controversial issue with some people as you know a lot of people believe that um, the climate is changing and that humans are responsible for this change in the environment I'm not sure I do to be honest um, I don't know either way at the moment I, I'm trying to I try to keep an open mind I mean, I'm not for pollution, so um, I certainly think we're polluting the environment, you know, and we're doing that through nuclear testing, for example, which is not only polluting the environment, but actually causing higher levels of cancer, I believe. I mean, it's proven scientific fact that nuclear detonations create cancer producing um, clouds of um, mushroom clouds. So. The fact that there's been a, over, over a thousand nuclear tests over the over the last um, 50 to 65 years, surely that can't be right. And it, if you look at the video on YouTube, type in all the nuclear detonations since 1945. There's a Japanese guy who's made a video of that, I believe. You'll see it spread out across the entire planet where we've got puffs of smoke going up with um, cancer, uh, producing mushroom clouds at regular intervals and over a thousand of them. So have, have a look at that video anyway. Um, 
So anyway, I, I, I don't think we should be um, harming our environment, but I am slightly suspicious about some of the agenda because I believe some, especially when it's connected to the government, because I believe what they do is latch on to some problems that they see uh, the population has taken under their wing and then try to exploit it. And uh, I was never impressed with Al Gore, to be honest. Um, again, it, it, it comes back to the blind trust in authority example, which is on the back of Truth Sentinel t-shirts now available. Sorry, quick, quick plug there. Um, Basically, what I'm saying is questioning climate change does not mean that you have to be someone who goes around throwing lit litter, spraying pollutants into the air, etc. You can still, you know, t switch off light switches, conserve water. By the way, not, you know, conserving water. Water may be one of the biggest issues coming up worldwide. People are predicting there may be wars fought over water at some point. And... Um, so the bu ice, the bucket challenge wasn't perhaps a good idea, chucking water over yourself. Um, no offence to anyone who did that. I'm just saying, you know, that was an extreme waste of water there. And the people who, um, the charity that um, benefited, a lot of people were sent, donated money to, um, more than a million pounds of that money goes to, um, in the UK, goes to the salaries of just not a large number of people that million pound they, they're all on sort of 250 to 350 thousand pounds each i wonder if they got any bonuses um i think um you know again it's the distribution of wealth is it a fair distribution of wealth i don't know anyway so again what what, what i'm saying about climate change is fine look after the planet but don't put it at the top of your list you know because there's there's a lot of other big problems you know how about taking care of each other first then take care of the planet i think the planet's pretty resilient actually i think it's uh, maybe a little bit arrogant of us to assume that we're you know basically this this particular generation is going to wipe out this planet I'm not sure personally I'm just saying i'm not sure i'm not i'm not someone who denies climate change i don't know to be honest i i haven't seen enough evidence that um that proves it's definitely happening. I won't blindly accept that it is happening. I'm not just going to blindly accept it. Um, the problem with charts and uh, pie charts and things that Al Gore relied on is you can just make those up about anything, to be honest. Um, so just to be clear again, I'm not denying climate change. I'm just saying haven't seen enough evidence. And I think what I don't like is people being ostracized, scientists being ostracized who talk out against it. And there are scientists who say, no, this isn't happening. The ozone layer has always had holes in it and temperature changes and weather changes, um, even extreme weather changes that we see have always been there. So anyway, we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, and the other thing I don't like about um, the climate change agenda is making, again, people feel like they are the virus upon the planet. I think it buys into that a little bit. Uh, it does tie in a little bit with population control. I've, I've even heard one campaigner saying he would be willing to die himself if millions of other humans died with him in order to preserve the earth. Uh, sorry, that's just nonsense. That's crazy talk, in my opinion. What do you think, anyway? Um, so you can sort of see what when you hear about people like him saying that you can sort of see what people are saying when people say the green agenda does have a little a little bit of earth worship as part of its philosophy and i think sheila will be talking about that later that's just her view and um i think it's important to listen to everybody's points of view on this climate issue and not to get angry if someone and sort of accuse someone of wanting to destroy the planet if they ha have these views because that's where the danger in it is just blindly believing stuff without checking out the facts and without talking about it. And this is the main problem with today's society, not being able to question um, facts or question uh, topics, being tr herd mentality, trying to control people, accusing people of, be of being things they're not if they're just questioning. You know, don't question 9-11, otherwise you're unpatriotic. 
don't question war, otherwise you're not supporting the troops. It's all part of manipulation and control. Anyway, um, so I, I'm just saying take care of each other first. That's the priority. Um, I think we're more likely to destroy each other and all life with nuclear weapons before we destroy our own planet, which is pretty resilient anyway. So some of you may know Sheila from the Hagman and Hagman show. Let's just go to the interview and um, talk with Sheila now. Hello, Sheila. Hello, Scott. Hi, welcome to Truth Sentinel. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be on your program. It's very nice to have you. How's things in uh, Canada at the moment? Well, probably not unlike the UK. Um, there's definitely some uh, interesting things happening in Western Canada and also, of course, across the North American continent. A lot of interesting things indeed. Indeed, there are. Um, and you'll be doing some shows this weekend. I, I've, I, heard, I heard you on Hagman and Hagman, first of all. How did you become involved with that show? Well, I had a show for years. Um, in fact, I had a couple of different shows. I started actually in radio with a, a special forces fellow that was working in PSYOP. And uh, we had done some shows and then actually... One of the guests that I had brought on ended up filling in as a co-host, and the audience liked him so much, they, the, the network asked him and I, which is Dr. Tim Ball, he's a renowned climatologist who wrote The Deliberate Corruption of Climate Science, incredible, brilliant man. He's you know, taught climatology for over 25 years, just incredible. He was really instrumental in the climate gate scandal, etc. Just incredible person. I actually ended up doing a fairly ongoing show with him for several years, uh, we had a kind of an interesting format, but we started really gaining momentum. And then it was interesting because I was a guest. I was a guest on quite a few shows, but I, in particularly one show, I was asked to come on the Hagman show. And at that time, I had just left a network, and I guess that some of the listeners has had inundated Doug and Joe and myself actually in you know in terms of joining alliances, forming a fusion. And we, you know, after careful consideration, that's what we ended up doing. So um, I was invited to do a weekend show with them, and that's what we do now. And it's actually quite a robust audience, and it's been a wonderful, it's really been a wonderful collaboration. It's a great show, actually. I really, I, I listen to Hagman and Hagman quite a lot and listen to yourself on there as well. Um, it's really informative. Um, you know, you get they, they get some good guests as well who seem to know a lot about what goes on behind the scenes. Well, yeah, there's there's such an acceleration of incredible things unfolding that it's, you know, I mean, you can't make these headlines up nowadays. And there's a lot of, I mean, we're seeing literally prophecy on fire right now. We're seeing Bible prophecy fulfilled. And that's, uh, you know, we try to always keep it. I mean, it is a Christian-based conservative show, but we do try to really have an eclectic mishmash of guests, a real variety. But again, a lot of our guests, I'm going to say, are really bring the biblical perspective, sort of end time news type of venue. It'd be similar to True News, you know, Rick Wiles, it'd be very similar to that kind of a format. It's not as much Alex Jones with all the, uh, you know, I find Alex Jones is a lot of sort of the regurgitation of you know, the police state and this and that, but we always try to kind of come with a Christian perspective of it. Yeah, no, and that's that's good. I mean, on my show, we try to look at all the different perspectives, but it's a Christian perspective as well. Um, today, we were going to have a look at um, the book of Revelations and prophecy, like you mentioned, and, and end, end times kind of uh, chat about end times. Do you yourself, do you feel like um, a lot of Christians believe we're in end times now? Do you feel we are? And what, what gives you that feeling? Well, one of the things that's really interesting is, and I, I think we're in a really significant time here. You know, shortly before his crucifixion and resurrection, Jesus Christ delivered a major prophecy of end time events, Scott, and it's recorded in Matthew 24. Uh, you can find it again in Mark 13 and Luke 21. And he was asked by his disciples, when will all these things be? And one of the things that he was asked, and it was phrased very interesting, they asked him, what will be the sign of your coming? 
end of the end of the age. So in Matthew 24, 3, people can look that up. Jesus responded with a description of conditions and events that would lead up to his actual coming. And that would be obviously a second coming. So, you know, and moreover, what was really interesting, Scott, is he said that these signs became evident his return would occur within one generation. And I really do believe this is that generation. I mean, you know, although it's been nearly 2,000 years since Christ gave that prophecy, many, I mean, we obviously have have grandparents or you know great grandparents and they thought that their generation was the time of his return and turned out to be wrong of course but interestingly there are a number of prophecies in the bible that could not be fulfilled in term in, until this sort of modern era more you know the post world war ii period and i really believe that they're describing conditions that are literally unfolding right now and uh, it's it's just really fascinating and you know, I think even the most person with the most virulent normalcy bias, Scott, will look around and go, something's off. You know, people sense in their spirit that something's not good. I mean, we see the lawlessness ramping up. We see, you know, like I said, you can't make these headlines up. There's, uh, I was actually stunned the other day. There was teenagers that were putting out, uh, people can actually do a search on this. It's called the Blaspheme God Challenge. So, you know, there's just ubiquitous lawlessness abounds there's all this pressure for this politically correct sort of watered down lukewarm christianity you know and and i really think that america for the most part now why i use america is because america really has always been the sort of you know standing bastion of freedom around the world there's never been a, a you know people call it a democracy but it is a constitutional republic and that's important to know because there's nothing ever been like the United States Constitution ever. There's never been anything since. There's never been anything before. It is not the last free country in the world. It was the only freestanding country in the world and it remains to be that. Unfortunately, a soulless group of clandestine technocratic oligarchs have really hijacked and pillaged, I call it pirate terms here, Scott, pillaged, plundered, pilfered, the United States, and I think America's at war, and some people don't even know that. Really, everything from technology to their culture, everything is absolutely being plundered. And this progressive ideology, it's really kind of a Marxist socialism, even neo-fascism that's all interwoven into one. And people have to understand that Obama is a not just a legal immigrant, he's not just a Muslim, but he's also... Uh, one of the globalist puppets that is really doing things that he is told to do. So it's not all on Obama. He's just simply, you know, he's a chess player in the bigger game. And he is a very nefarious fellow. Let me leave it at that. Well, he does seem to lie a lot. I've noticed that. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> look, nice looking at some of his promises that he made, I was looking at some of his election promises. I mean, a lot of politicians do that, but he seems to have taken it to another level, you know, with, with things he's promised and then the actual opposite he's done, you know? Yeah, he's absolutely, he says one thing. And um, actually, there was a YouTube video that really kind of gives credence to this it was actually saying something that he said and something he said later and they're absolutely so ridiculously virulently opposite and it's it's just it's stunning it actually is stunning the lies that this just has churned out of this person's mouth absolutely i mean when you look at um some of the things that are going on right now now i don't know how familiar your audiences with American politics. I mean, obviously, I think, um, we do have a quite a large number of American listeners. So some some people will will be familiar, but others won't. There'll be people from the UK and people from other countries too. Well, absolutely. Well, I'm sure your audience understands the the setup of the Constitution, and essentially, what's been happening is there's really Scott been a steady erosion of of the Constitution, really, and it's just absolutely mind numbing when you look around. And I think one of the biggest things, and why, and I'll I'll tell you where I'm going with this. Um, years ago, Tim and I, the biggest thing that got me in broadcasting was the fact that I was a high-level executive for environment for years and years, and I really knew there was something very shady about the whole climate debate. You know, I kept hearing this global warming, global warming, and I would look at these interesting reports that would be submitted by industry and oil companies, and I was doing a lot of negotiations as an approvals director 
um, you know, because when you're dealing with environment, our mandate is land, air, water, and biodiversity. And some of the reports that I was seeing were very, let's just say, nefarious. And I thought, it's very interesting. At that time, that is actually when I got a hold of Dr. Tim Ball. And I said, what is your take on this, you know, this big green agenda? And I think it's just really important for people to understand something here. The green agenda, and I think why this is so important, Scott, is because the green agenda is actually part of this, um, the, this overall more, I guess, sinister kind of thing. So... I'm going to actually explain what I mean by that. Mm -hmm. Years ago, I had interviewed an incredible man. He had a PhD in ecosystems analysis, and he led a multi-million dollar research project in the 90s on global warming, and he is the leading expert on Agenda 21. And in fact, I'm having it on my show again this Saturday. So really respected man. He and his group actually stopped a convention on biological diversity being ratified in the United States Senate. And what's really important about that is that if he had not ratified that, we would be full-scale, full-spectrum dominant. So, you know, and I always say people have to understand that progressive ideology, I mean, it sounds good, right? And, and all these terms are such, it, this is the issue. They're very benevolent kinds of sounding things, but it's always very ma malevolent. Like, for example, sustainability. It sounds good, eco-friendly. It all sounds like really good terms. It sounds like they're really taking the high road, but here's the problem with that. They're not, and they have very, like I said, nefarious roots, and I'll get into a little bit of that, but so the problem is, is that nowadays, though, our kids are so indoctrinated, you know, they have no connection to the Constitution, liberty, freedom, they never question the mainstream, which is permeated with progressive ideology, so they never really find the truth, but rather they're fed this steady diet of lies. So they don't understand the precepts of liberty and wealth creation. And this is the key to free market system in America. This is capitalism. The key is why our founders set things up the way they did. And over the last few decades, we have seen this systematic attack on our property rights, you know, turning all the property rights over to the UN, which is the most diabolical of all creations. And they're always running around parading as Grand Peace Central, but they're not. It's quite, like I said, it's quite more insidious. And most of us don't understand how critically important property rights are. Our freedoms, our liberties, and wealth creation, you cannot create wealth without private property. And it's basically the socialist, well, this, I guess socialism is a better word that we see in Europe right now that was started over 200 years ago by Jean-Jacques Rousseau. And that whole model of, it's really a model of complete tyranny. So, I mean, you know that we, with that sort of socialist system has done to the European nation, and socialism, it really demonizes wealth creation. So when we read statements out of the Agenda 21 protocol, like pro property ownership can result in social injustice, I mean, that is just absolutely staggering. So to give people an understanding is eugenics huckster, Zbigniew Brzezinski, I'm sure your audience is familiar with that term, he openly proposed a 300-page book, and it was called Two Ages. And some of the recommendations in that book led to the formation of the Trilateral Commission, which he then led for many years. And in this article, he laments that a single leap into world government, which, of course, he preferred, wasn't attainable. So he was urging this end run around national sovereignty, eroding it piece by piece, and then he was advocating for a piecemeal transfer to the UN's International Money Fund. So it's called the IMF. It's a monetary fund set up by the UN and pretty much the banking cartel and the UN's World Bank. And there was some other things like their food conference and their population. But here's the problem. When you have all these globalist pals and you've got, you know, Zbigniew Brzezinski and the who's who of the globalists, kind of you know, these heavyweight hucksters with these you know, the redistribution of wealth plans, really, they're, you know, it's a complete termination of your basic freedom. So your religion, your speech, your property rights, it's a complete regimentation of all human activity. And that is very nefarious, Scott. So anyway, what does this have to do with sort of what's happening now is there's been a very, again, it's very insidious, it's very longly planned out. I mean, you have 
the Federal Reserve that's been in place since 1913. There is this cabal of collectivists that have really orchestrated many world events leading up to now. And really the green agenda has a very sinister uh, component to it. And, you know, because like I said, sustainable development, it sounds good. But if you attend a Christian church now, you're being taught to follow Gaia. You're being taught about sustainability from your preachers, and they've mixed in the Bible and the goals of the UN. And Gaians teach that the divine earth must be protected at no matter what cost. So essentially, you have, you have Scott, you basically have less rights than a rock. And Al Gore in his book, Earth in the Balance, echoed this view that prehistoric Europe and so much of the world, he said, was based on the worship of a single earth goddess who was assumed to be, you know, the fount of all life and radiated harmony and blah, blah, blah. And then he goes on to say, you know, the last vestige of organized goddess worship was eliminated by Christianity. And he was throwing out words like 15th century in Lithuania. He was quoting to Chardin, you know, the fate of mankind depends on an emergence of a new faith in the future. Well, what faith was that? The earth is our mother. So this Gaia worship, Scott, is at the very heart of the global green agenda. And, you know, this sustainable development, eco-friendly agenda 21, the earth charter and the global warming hype, you know, it was global warming. Now they flipped it to climate change and now Al Gore calls it climate crises. But it's all part of the Gaian's mission to save Mother Earth from human infestation. And don't forget, it's not Sheila Zielinski saying this. Look at some of the statements out of these globalist mouth. Prince Philip said that if he could ever be reincarnated and come back, he'd come back to Earth as a deadly virus to wipe out the, the scourge that is humans. I mean, why don't we start with you there, Prince Philip? Oh, believe me. <laughs> I'm, not a, I'm not a big fan of his. Yeah, I mean, you can tell that um, he would actually like to come back as a virus and get rid of everyone, but not maybe the, uh, well, uh, basically not the elite. Yeah, yeah leave them behind. Yeah, well, the elite sort of believe in their brains that, you know, they have. I mean, it's kind of a real interesting sociot uh, sociopathy with these people because, you know, when you have a megalomaniac, absolute sociopath, and I really believe these British inbred bloodlines, the Rothschilds trace their roots back to antiquity, and they believe actually that, you know, they're going back to the Nimrodian era. So, I mean, you know, that's going pretty far back. So you have essentially these royal bloodlines, these Illuminati kingpin families. And uh, in his book, The 13 Bloodlines of the Illuminati, Fritz Springmar really uh, lays this out like no one else. And he really connects these families and, you know, uh, things like, okay, what's the difference between Illuminati and the Freemasons and these other secret society like Skull and Bones? Um, he really lays out very deep... Um, really in-depth information in his books and so you've got these again inbred families um these royal bloodlines and they are hell-bent on complete totalitarian aka bringing in their new world order and they will not stop until they achieve that and, 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 and they even um they even managed to get the support of the population because here in the uk it's only um, a minority that actually talk against the royal family, but it's a ridiculous idea. The the idea that you give a family just based on their bloodline um, everything they ever going to need, you know, and more, a uh, ten times, a million times more than they're ever going to need in in re respect of wealth, uh, clothes, food, travel. We pay for everything, and people seem to accept it here. And the more I the more I've thought about, it, the more ridiculous it seems. Well, <laughs> ridiculous, yeah, it, very much so. And I think what's very disturbing to me, and I see this, you touched on it, is this absolute loyalty to the monarch. And what's really disgusting to me, and people, my gosh, you know, people lose their minds when I, when I say things like this. I have people, you know, all over the world that listen to our show, and I get just absolutely relegated to the depths of the dam for coming out with this stuff but here's the thing do some research you know people just kind of you know they're walking around in this dystopic trance singing kumbaya while rome burns around us here but they are not informed scott and that is the biggest that's the biggest disturbing thing to me is people don't buy oh it's the queen well let's bow down to the queen but it's interesting because canada actually is still really under 
a constitutional monarchy as well, which is, you know, we still do pay homage to the good old queen. Mm. I mean, she's more of a symbolic figurehead, but, you know, it is absolutely unbelievable. And people, again, can actually... I, I will see if I can provide a link to this. But if people type in Sheila Zelinsky, Dave Hodges, if you do a quick Google search and you type in the CPS ring or just the word CPS, which is Child Protective Services, Dave Hodges and I really get into the bowels of how insidious, nefarious, and ominous this queen really is and some of her connections to child sex rings, you know, child sex, uh, really deep kind of sacrificial satanic children sacrificial you know also just really nefarious stuff and absolutely and um that that's a massive uh, topic in the uk at the moment because um we've got a, a western westminster um abuse child abuse uh, scandal going on at the moment and people behind the scenes in the alternative media know about the connection to the royal royal family but nobody in the mainstream is prepared to talk about that in fact the police i know have have said they don't want any mention they don't want the royal family brought into this when there's some clear links there well, what's very interesting is these people seem like they're really the untouchables, don't they? They do, yeah. And, and it's not just the, ro the royalty. I mean, I noticed Obama flew in the other day and stopped in the UK. And he stopped at Stonehenge. I don't know if you heard about that. Yes, too, I did you? hear about that. Isn't that interesting? Well, what, what it showed me is, well, the, these people do, re they really are um, considered to be gods almost. Because if I go and see Stonehenge, I can only get about, you know, within couple of hundred meters of it because there's a big cordon around it members of the public you know the plebs basically the they can't pleb. they can't go anywhere near it but he can come in just walk straight into it and uh, there's barbed wire around it and a family were, were able to meet him and uh he he shook hands with them over the barbed wire and they were saying how how nice he was but to, to be honest if he was that nice he would have invited them in past the barbed wire wouldn't he? you don't shake hands with someone over barbed wire <laughs> Wow, isn't that just, you see, that kind of information is just mind-numbing and staggering to me. And, you know, we've got so many issues going on that he really should be dealing with, and yet he's not. Don't you find that really fascinating that Obama is, quite frankly, he's not doing anything that he's supposed to be doing as a commander-in-chief. Well, how about he, nuclear weapons? I mean, he made some pledge uh, in his election campaign that he was going to do something about getting rid of them. And they make it sound so complicated that you couldn't just get rid of them. But actually, you know what? If, they, if someone really made the effort and someone like Obama would have the influence to bring all the world leaders together and just get rid of them because they say they'll get, you know, that they don't like chemical weapons. But, and, and that's such a terrible thing. But nuclear weapons, <laughs> you can't get much worse than that, really. They, they, they should just get rid of them. Well, the thing is that, he, you know, he, again, he says one thing and he does the exact opposite. And we had a, a nuclear weapon debacle in South Carolina last fall where there was actually nuclear weapons that went missing. And there was CIA, you know, top level CIA people and military officers. I've had, you know, CIA operatives, uh, former CIA military, you know, even three star generals I've had connections with that have really very much solidified some of the practices Obama has, you know, carried out, including a complete, um, he did a complete house cleaning of the military when he did his little litmus test to see if soldiers would fire on American people. I mean, you got to think about all the things happening right now. There's just no end to everything going on concurrently. You mentioned nuclear weapons. We've got ISIS, you know, ramping things up. This you know, I'm sure if you've been under a rock is the only way you haven't heard about this Islamic militant group ISIS, formerly known as Al-Qaeda in Iraq and recently branded as the so-called Islamic State of, I mean, really, this is the stuff of nightmare, folks. These are ruthless, fanatical killers on a mission, and their mission really is to wipe out anyone and every everything from any other religion and impose Sharia law. And these mass executions and beheadings and even crucifixions they're committing are like badges of pride. You know, they're videotaped and uploaded for the world to see. This is really the new face of evil, Scott. But here's the thing. I wonder if people in the UK or, for that matter, worldwide would be interested to know who helped fund these, well, fund and arm these psychopaths. You know, and so 
the American government has been really deeply involved. And yesterday was actually September 11th, um, which is interesting, 13 years after the terrorist attacks. And that has never been resolved with the American people. You had a poll out just last week saying people actually are really starting to believe that 9-11 was an inside job. And yet, why has it always been crickets chirping when it comes to a real actual investigation? So, you know, you've got all these sort of false flags brewing, you've got the Ukraine situation heating up, you know, and back home here in the States, it's Caligula level crazy town. Terrorists have more control, more territory, more weapons and money than they've ever had, you know, and there's still, again, what's, what's disturbing is this, and again, why I brought originally how familiar your audience is with U.S. politics is the people are unilaterally disarming against this enemy. So we're becoming really isolated, we're abandoning our allies, we're leaving big chunks of the world open for these subhuman barbarians to get stronger. And there's been lately a lot of talk that, yeah, ISIS is now in the U.S. and, you know, there's going to be some false flags. And But, you know, the, the staggering thing is, Scott, that we have fewer combat-ready soldiers since before World War I. Our military is so badly degraded. And we used to be the big military juggernaut of the world. So, and we won't build a secure system for our border. You, you know, you see, I don't know if your people see, because, of course, the mainstream media just churns out what they want you to know. But there's uh, just absolutely insanity going on at our borders in lockstep with all these other things. So, like, if you step back and take a macro view, no one in government supports securing the United States borders. The politicians won't build a secure system for the border. If you now support a secure border and the deportation of people flooding in, well, you're a racist. You know, Obama won't act, Congress won't act, nobody's acting. And you've got guys like Chuck Hagel referring to ISIS as some of the most brutal barbaric forces ever, but uh, a force in a dimension that the world has never seen. So my question is, what are we doing about it? You know, I think, honestly, Obama said, let me find the most stupidest guy on earth and let me make him Secretary of Defense. Let me find the second stupidest guy ever and I'll appoint him Secretary of State and the third stupidest I'll make is him. That, is that John Kerry? <laughs> well, also the CIA I, I, I get a real bad vibe from that guy whenever I see him on TV. It just He just seems, some, sometimes he seems to be in a trance and um, you know, oh, he, he just seems to have a, a, a complete thirst for war. Oh, yeah, he's an absolute total piece of work, that guy. He actually should be charged and hung with high treason, actually, really. I, I'm not even being slightly, I'm not even being, you know, usually when I say things like that, I'm being a little bit facetious, but I'm not even saying that as uh, facetious. He actually, a lot of these hedonistic hucksters should be tried for treason. I mean, we, we're in a post-constitutional crisis. You know, there's more fraudulent shenanigans by this imperial president, Obama, or as I call him, Obama. You know, there we've got these 375, almost four, I think it's 400,000 pending immigration cases. They keep pushing them through. The courts are in this chaotic backlog. The system is set up to fail. Again, these, you know, like I said, fraudulent shenanigans by this imperial dictator. We're in a post-constitutional crises and this is what's very scary our appointments clause is under attack our commerce clause is under attack our first amendment 14th the treaty clause i mean incredible i mean that is the stuff news is made about i mean the amazing thing is you have these so-called civil libertarians out there saying not one word these phony fraud liberals and journalists out there i can think of about 30 impeachable offenses by this commander-in-chief but we're not allowed to talk about that do you think this commander-in-chief that you talk about do you think um as we were talking about the end times um do you think it's possible that he could be the commander-in-chief that sort of uh leads the west into the the final battle of armageddon that's mentioned in revelations well you know a lot of people talk about him being the antichrist but um you know, you've got to, there's kind of four prophecies unfolding now, and on this lens, I mean, obviously there's more to come, but you got to think about the seven-year period and begin an occurrence with, I mean, may not be, okay, like it may not be in a perfect sequential order, but you've got, okay, think about this biblically, I mean, every day is kind of like a nature hike through the book of Revelation, but then you've got to put Daniel 
and some of the other heavy hitters prophetically of the Bible, Isaiah, Daniel, you've got to sort of sequentially put this into a context. You've got a Middle East treaty to be signed, so that's confirmation of the covenant. You've got, you know, the mark of the beast. You've got prophetic destiny of Europe, a third temple to be built. That's pre-abomination. You've got the Antichrist revealed. So does the Great Tribulation begin in the middle of a seven-year period known as the Tribulation? Some think so, some do not. They're actually working on a peace treaty right now. So you've got this acceleration of things unfolding. Like I said, we talked about that earlier in the show. There is a lot of Bible Bible prophecy unfolding right now. Well, um, I know it says, in I'm not sure which book, whether it's um, Ezekiel, Daniel, Revelations about... Israel becoming a nation and a generation won't pass until these things come to pass, which um, I think was 1948, wasn't it? So, um, well, yeah, actually, it's really interesting because if you go to, um, I believe, well, okay, think about that, I think it's Second Thessalonians 2.7, and we've got Michael the Archangel. Michael is the one restraining the Antichrist. It's Michael the restrainer which will be taken out of the way so that the revelation of the Antichrist might be manifest. So once Michael's taken out of the way, he will be ascend into the heavens and begin war with Satan to cast him down to earth. So there's several events that will simultaneous take place here. Um, the first event will be the stopping of the daily sacrifice. The second will be the revelation of the Antichrist. And the third sequence of events will be removal of Michael the Archangel. So when all these events suddenly, those simultaneously take place, this will begin the Great Tribulation period. And Paul said nothing about anything being taken out of the world. He said plainly that someone was going to be taken out of the way. Um, so, yeah, it's absolutely men that have corrupted the Word of God to declare that something's taken out of the world. It's Paul that says very distinctly, I mean, he didn't say any such thing, and, and a lot of people, you know, if you go read Daniel 12, 1, it says, and at that time Michael shall stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of the people, and there will be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And if you go to the Strong's Concordance and you look up that word standeth, it's amad. In Hebrew, that means rise up, mount up. So, you know, the, the, you really, the doctrine of the Bible has absolutely really been twisted. And so that's the problem is a lot of people don't really have a good comprehension of, of biblical, um, you know, what it really means behind the Bible scripture. And if you really intensively study it out, there's absolutely no question in my mind that we're living in the very last days. I suppose for some people, they're not sure what's symbolic and what's literal. I mean, because if you look at Revelations, you've got... You've got a lot of interesting characters. You've got people sitting on thrones, 24 crowned elders. I think that could, I mean, I think there might be about 20 in, uh, in the UN at the moment. Uh, you've got four living creatures, um, lions, horsemen, angels, um, trumpeteers. You've got that, the wormwood star, yeah. uh, sc scorpion-tailed locusts. Uh, you've got Abaddon, two witnesses, um, a woman and a child. There's, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of people mentioned and uh, images of beasts from the sea. People aren't always sure what's symbolic and what's going to be a literal beast from the sea. You know. Yeah, you're right. I mean, you know, here's the thing. I mean, you have to have from a biblical perspective, you have to understand the father evenly divided a lot of things up between the prophets. So, I mean, revelation for some people is just right over their head. But if you get into a really intensive study on it and you study it out and you study those words in the Greek and Hebrew, you, you'll see very quickly that there's a picture that starts to emerge. And you have to put it in context with everything else. You know, um, again, Daniel is very significant. And the Antichrist, the false prophet, these are things that are highlighted not just in the book of Revelation. So, you know, one of the really good books I recommend people get to really understand Revelation um, and as a matter of fact, if you go to weekendvigilante.com, my website, and you click on the show from September 6, click on that, and there's actually uh, a link to Pastor David Langford's book, Revelation 13 Revealed, but it also talks about a lot of other scripts. It's not just Revelation 13, but Revelation 13 is the one 
that is kind of the big kahuna, you know, the really big kahuna that gets into the, you know, the nitty gritty about what's going to, you know, what's going to happen. The, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the second beast, the false prophet, it really walks you through a gambit. So I, I really highly recommend that people order that book. And it's a very inexpensive book that is an incredible compilation. He's got another book called The Book of Jude that is very good. I'm sure your listeners would love that too. And um, I mean, one thing that people are interested in is the obviously the number 666, although I've heard some people say it's actually 616. Um, and, you know, a lot of people have said that could be the, the uh, microchip under the skin uh, on your hand or your forehead. Do you think that's going to happen? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, here's the thing. There's a lot of talk about the chip, of course. Um, the Mark of the Beast, when you read, you know, no man can buy or trade, no man can buy or sell, I think that's how it's worded, that's without right, yeah. mark. I mean, we don't really know for sure what this mark is, but it's definitely, if you study that out, it's definitely something that it is a predominant mark. It's not just, uh, you know, a lot of people say things like, oh, well, it's just a symbolic thing. No, I really do think that without this particular mark, whether that's um, some kind of, t I mean, I think about the, the Nuremberg uh, case where you have a lot of people tattooed, you know, it would make sense that it could be an RFID chip. It could be something. Well, think about this, though. Every single thing in your wallet, all your these IDs are just biometric tracking devices anyway. They're all linked together. Your medical records are all linked to your driver's license, to your passport, to your banking information, to your medical records. Everything in a system. I mean, they're hacking, tracking, attacking us. We've got sound cat and citizen spies we've got you know big brother cameras on every corner everything in our daily lives are being under the watchful eye of big brother so why wouldn't it stand to reason that especially in this cashless society that we are you know breakneck speed railing into why wouldn't it make sense that it could be something as easy as an rfid chip i don't know for certain what it is that could be even a precursor to it but you know there's definitely something and it won't be something like, oh, I was vaccinated and they inserted a chip. It will be something that you will choose to get, I believe. I really believe from studying the scripture, it's not something that the government can just come and, you know, give you a shot of something and you're just, there's nothing you can do. I think it'll come down to refusing it or, or not. Yeah, and it does. It does sort of make sense that because everything is heading that way. I, by the way, I said twenty-four crown uh, elders could refer to the European Union. I said there's twenty now. It's actually twenty-eight now. So four would have to drop out. Um, what about um, talking about the mark of the beast and everything? What about the opposite? I mean, it does mention that Jesus is going to come back again. Do you think there's a possibility that the Messiah that the uh, Jews talked about in the Old Testament? Um, do you think it's possible? that Jesus could already be down on earth? No, I don't think that's possible based on what I read. Um, here's the thing, people, there's a lot of pre-tribulation rapture um, schools of thought, and I absolutely vehemently disagree with the pre-trib rapture. I do not believe that Christ is just going to come back, you know, um, in the next week or whatever. I believe the Bible is correct, and if you study it out, it really talks about a great tribulation. And so, I mean, yeah, things are bad, but we haven't seen nothing yet. Do I believe that Christ will come back in our time? I have reason to believe that just based on everything I'm seeing in the, the you know, Jesus talks about things unfolding like labor pains. Now, what that means is things are getting stronger faster at the end. And my goodness, we see such an acceleration even in the last few years, Scott, that it would really make sense that it's very possible that our generation will see the return of Christ. But in the meantime, I think things are going to get absolutely unbelievably bad. How do you think people would recognize him? Because, I mean, there are people that have already come forward and said that they're uh, Christ. In fact, I, I even interviewed one on this um, on my my show uh, who says he's the Messiah. But And there's a guy in Australia um who says he's Jesus' return. I mean, he actually seemed like quite a nice guy. I don't think he is Jesus, but he says he is. And he, um, how, how are people going to know who this person is when he comes back? Well, you know, there used to be an expression when you were younger, well, how will I know when I'm in love? And they used to say, you'll just know. <laughs> mm. Although it may not be a good example, 
I don't think there is going to ever be a replication of what is, is going to happen. This is not something you're just going to wonder about. I, I really believe that true believers are going to absolutely know that they know. Uh, and I don't believe this is something you can stage. Um, I really, yeah, there's a lot of people in the Bible talks about in the end times there'll be many false prophets. Look at the false prophets, you know, this ubiquitous plethora of pulpiteers now that are churning out false doctrine. I mean, you've got Joel Osteen and the people like Rick Warren that are pumping out the Chrislam, these big mega preachers, I call them telepickpocketists, they are absolutely just churning out false doctrine. And, uh, you know, the Bible is very clear on what happens to people like that. You know, very political, correct, lukewarm, watered down phrases of, uh, again, you know, don't want to offend anybody. And it, it's just absolutely unbelievable. There's not a lot of men today that are preaching the true gospel. Uh, Pastor David Lankford from The Voice of Evangelism is one of the few men I know that is really a prolific scriptorian and old fashioned powerhouse preacher. And that's, other than him, I, there's, just a handful of men that I know. Um, there was some men that are now passed away. Uh, Leonard Ravenhill was one of my favorites. Derek Prince, incredible. Uh, I think Derek Prince has a lot of still good information on the... It's Derek, like D-E-R-E-K, Prince. You might want to Google him. He's got excellent material. I've heard of him, actually. I remember when I was growing up hearing about him. Uh, he used to cast out, um, uh, cast out demons and things like that. Very, very incredible, powerful deliverance minister. And, I mean, healing and deliverance was just, yeah, absolutely incredible man. And, you know, he is such a soft-spoken and, and astute and brilliant man, and yet he is just so gifted in, in the gospel. Um, we're going to have to go shortly, but I just I wanted to ask you a quick fire questions. Um, Wormwood, the star that's mentioned in Re Revelation, do you have any theory on that? I mean, some people talk about asteroids. Some people say that the actual Chernobyl um, translated uh, means Wormwood in Ukrainian and Russian, which which I know it does. Um, but any theories on what that could be about the star named Wormwood that uh, maybe that's mentioned in Revelations? Yeah, you know, I to be honest, there's so many different ways that that's spun. You're right. I mean, could be an asteroid. There, yeah, I don't have a really strong opinion on that. There's a few things that I used to think, and then, and now I'm just, I'm not too sure on that theory. No, no real big, you know, light bulb moments of, about Wormwood. Okay, okay. Um, another question, a final question, really. Um. You do shows such as The Weekend Vigilante. What's on your radar at the moment? What are you going to be talking about? Um, uh, well, it's really interesting because, again, I have Dr. Michael Kaufman on. We broadcast from 8 Pacific right till 10 o'clock. Um, so we have Fritz Springmeier, the author of The Bloodlines of the Illuminati. So, again, I have an eclectic mishmash of guests, and you can find all the information about our times on the website weekendvigilante.com. And there's a lot of great information on there. There's end time news headlines. Um, there's a weekly prayer uh, group that I've set up. You know, it's a call in prayer line. I think never in the history of mankind do we need prayer more than we do right now. So um, there's a lot of good information. Again, our Saturday night shows is called the Weekend Edition. The instigator and the investigator of the airwaves kind of teaming up for you know a very interesting show. So Doug Hagman from Hagman and Hagman and I do a Saturday night weekend show, and it's it's really been quite uh, it's been fun. It's been really great to sort of collectively pool our audiences and bring people only the top notch, cutting edge guests. So I really enjoy it. Yeah, I've enjoyed listening to that as well, and um, enjoyed talking to you today. And um, we've only just started skirting over the topic, really. But um, I'd love it if you could come back at some point in the future, and we could really analyze it even more. If that's absolutely possible. Absolutely love to. Yes, would absolutely be just honored to do that again, Scott. Thanks for coming then, and um, please pass on my regards to Hagman and Hagman as well, um, the father and son. Never met or spoken to them, but I do like what they're doing as well. And uh, good luck with your, your show. Hope it goes well. And uh, thanks very much for coming on today. My pleasure, Scott. And thank you very much for your listeners for um, catching this broadcast today. Thanks, Sheila. So thanks to Sheila for that a nice talking to her let me know what you think about some of the topics we covered uh, leave a voicemail and uh, we can comment it i'll directly respond to any of your comments you make on voicemail in the next episode and i'll put your voicemails in the episode just to be clear 
If you don't want your voicemail in the episode, don't leave one, just use the chat room instead. Today we have part two of a debate about positive thinking that we uh, we talked about in the previous episode of Honor Killings. I also talked with Anthony, our academic researcher, formerly from the University of Bilkent, now conducting further research uh, from the AGU State University in Kayseri, east of Cappadocia, in the shadow of the Urges volcano. Uh, yes, it's a bit of a mouthful. I am getting better at saying it now, though. Um, and volcanoes are also topical at the moment as um, there was an eruption in Japan, I believe, where some um, hikers are believed killed at the moment due to the immense power of um, the volcanic eruption there. So anyway, let's go to the um, part two of our chat. We were talking about um, positive thinking. Uh, Anthony's arguing in favor of, um, of basically that positive thinking movement is not a good thing and I'm sort of saying positive thinking is a good thing but I I mean I think we do reach some sort of agreement that um, I'm not really defending positive thinking movement that takes money from people and maybe gives some false hope um, so I hope it's sort of clear in what we're talking about um, that actually we're probably closer to agreeing with each other than we think but, uh, we left it as we were talking about manifestation, believing in the manifestation of your goal. Uh, you spend too much time, for example, dreaming about getting the perfect job after university. It's almost happened in your mind. So, so you're, you're perhaps a, a little less motivated to get down to the boring task of writing job applications. Yeah, that's just, called, that's just called laziness. That's nothing to do with, <laughs> that's nothing to do with positive thinking because I, I think positive thinking combined with positive action, and that's mm -hmm. a vital component. Mm -hmm. If you take out the positive action, then you're kind of just being lazy. That's all it is. <laughs> so, who, so who won the research fight? <laughs> <laughs> I think the research doesn't count for an awful lot, to be honest. That's what I was basically saying. Uh -huh. uh, I was just basically saying research doesn't count for an awful lot at the end of the day. Research is, is what fills scientific papers and gets uh, funding and that kind of stuff, you know. But, you know, I suppose it has some use, but it doesn't tell mm -hmm. us an awful lot because people can just create their own. I, I guess if you wanted to prove something, <clears throat> you could set up a research group in a certain way and you would achieve your outcome. Yeah. Yeah, I think that I think it's true. It's it's uh, very much regard. It's very much um, dependent on the the terms of the experiment. Yeah, we see that even in science as well. You can prove different scientific things are true, though they may be contradictory using different experiments. Well, for yeah. example, you can use statistics, and statistics are always used to prove an argument. But I could go out in the street now and say, positive thinking doesn't work, does it? in a very negative way and I'll get more people to say no you're right it doesn't because mm. I've said it in a negative way or I could go out and say positive thinking's great isn't it what do you think about mm. positive thinking do you think it works just a just a tone of voice could change the whole result so it's all it's all nonsense really yeah yeah okay uh, I w uh, there's just uh, two or three more things I want to mention if we have time yeah we have um, time yeah. uh, I think um so this positive thinking movement has been especially prevalent in American culture, yeah, uh, and it has a history there. I mean, you know, uh, aside from the fact that Americans just just have this opt uh, this reputation for being fairly chipper and optimistic people, <laughs> which I, I think is 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 probably true true to an extent, um, but uh, it, it has a, a a cultural history. So if if you go back some time. Uh, you, you find a movement of, of what were called uh, positivity preachers in, I think, the 1930s. Um, and they really kind of tapped into the natural optimism of Americans to keep them in thrall to the church. Yeah, there was one guy, for example, called Joel Osteen, who, who was sort of a celebrity of his day. Uh, he preached in Houston. And uh, these guys used to tell their congregations, you know, rejoice, don't worry about material things because God wanted them to have a big house and a nice car. You know, God, God was, was hoping for them to get these things. And so if God wanted it, it would happen. So uh, forget about, you know, being careful with money because this was preordained. This is what God wants for his people. And, and that's kind of dangerous uh, because, you know, if, if people take that literally, then... then <laughs> 
uh, then I mean they can become stuck in a in a in a cycle of of debt, and and most of the the, the faithful at these you know church congregations are not multimillionaires. Um, to to preach a message of don't worry about finance, God's going to sort it all out is 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 not the most responsible thing, and I and I and I think it it, it takes advantage of a of a of a character trait that's to be admired, which is you know optimism. Well, um, you know, there's there's scam artists around. There's people who'll charge, you know, a thousand dollars for to listen to them for one hour talking about how they don't need to worry about money. It'll it'll come to them if uh, if they just visualize it. Now, that's obviously nonsense, and they'll they're just they're just trying to make money themselves. Yeah. But I think one thing that you did say there about don't worry about uh, money, I have to agree with that because worry achieves nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, action, uh, positive thinking, and positive action, I would say, is the key. Uh, worrying achieves nothing so I agree with uh, whoever said that about mm. worrying don't worry about money don't worry about money but if you want it do something where you can get it okay um, all right so the last the last thing I wanted to say uh, about this is psychologically I think again we're talking about a, a, a spectrum here yeah um, uh, so, as I've said and you've said, being optimistic, not a problem. Uh, trying to see the best in a situation, not a problem. Probably a very sensible strategy. But, again, if you, if you take it too far, I, I, I think there are dangers to it. And the thing, where, uh, the thing which makes me feel perhaps most disturbed about the, the positive thinking movement is if you, um, if you relate it to to psychology I mean proper psychology not not pop psychology like like positive thinking uh, and in in particular um, I I've been really disturbed by some of the things that I've heard uh, positive thinking adherents say if you if you uh, listen to these people they often say you know if, if you keep your thoughts positive then then uh, negatives won't come to you and and if you allow yourself to be negative, that's when problems occur in your life. Now, I, because I'm a, a contrary bastard, <laughs> uh, I, I sometimes challenge these people and say things like, tell me about the case of the, the African child who has gone blind and is suffering from dysentery because he has a parasite in his eye that is crawling up into his brain which it will eventually eat, causing him to go mad before he dies. Tell me about that kid. And I, I stole this example from Sir David Attenborough. Um, Sir David Attenborough talked about this one of the rare times when, when he uh, actually gave his opinion about wider issues. You know, normally he's just there talking about um, the the biological creatures that he's seeing around him, and and keeps his opinion. Uh, masked, let's say, or keeps it away from the screen because it's not the time or place. But on occasion, <clears throat> if asked, he will say this: "I've seen some terrible things. For example, the the African child with the with the eye parasite case that I just mentioned. Uh, and and he said they make me really wonder if there's a god. What kind of god could could this this being be to let this happen? Right? Mm -hmm. That's his take on it." If you put it to a positive thinking person, you get some really disturbing responses. You know, so you, we, you go you go down these these paths where where people are saying, well, perhaps you know, um, this is meant to teach this child some kind of lesson, or perhaps it's about their parents, or and you just start to think, wow, a minute ago I was I was talking to somebody who was like a normal person whose opinions I could respect. Now I'm talking to a psychopath because. Nobody could say, oh, well, the kid with the, the, the parasite in his eye who's blind and, and, and shitting himself constantly and is going to go mad soon and then die before he reaches adulthood. Nobody could say, well, yeah, there's probably a reason for that. And in the big scheme of things, it's all karma. Like, it, it's just but not I, I think that's a very extreme. Uh, it's, it's not, I would say that's not generally um, what positive thinking people would say. I would say that's a very extreme minority group you're talking about who, ble who thinks people who've have got a disability uh it's a result of something they did you know uh, well, I, I think that's a very rare cases it's so I, I i would say uh about uh, i just wanted to address some of the things you said there um 
first of all, I don't think that's necessarily God that's done that. I think it's mankind. I mean, mm-hmm. we, the way we've set up society is going to, this is the result, basically, isn't it? Um, number number two, I would say it's not the job of that boy to to change his way of thinking and be positive because he's clearly in a in a bad situation. It's where positive thinking will work with that boy is for people outside uh, to look in and say, what can we do for this boy? We can do this. We can do that. Let's overcome these obstacles. Let's help him. So positive thinking can affect that boy from the outside in rather than giving him uh, uh, the burden of having to do it himself because he's already got enough problems as it is. I think that's a really valid point. And the next time I have that conversation, <laughs> I'm going to say exactly what you said. <laughs> um, but it, I, I, I've just been disturbed by by how easy it is to get these people on the back foot and, and get them saying crazy stuff, you know. Um, and, I, and I don't think that, uh, that, that they necessarily mean that. I think a lot of the people, I, I've, I've had this conversation with maybe half a dozen people uh, where it's ended up in that very disturbing territory. Uh, yeah, and- I, I, I have heard of this before, and um, you know, people who think that that people have got, so, you know, who've got a disability, they they've created themselves. I, I think that's a really dodgy area to go in into. It is. It is dodgy, and I and I suspect that some of these people don't sincerely mean it. They're just they're just on the back foot, and they're trying not to lose the argument. But but uh, well, but I, it, guess, I guess though you could say uh, people who believe in some forms of reincarnation, where if you do something bad, you're going to come back uh, in a worse form. So you know there are some people who believe that, aren't there? Yeah, and I have to tell you my Hari Krishna story one time. <laughs> Maybe not on the program, but about the Hare Krishna version of how you how you ascend from the from the point of being a caterpillar <laughs> up the up the evolutionary chain. You know what a caterpillar can do to better his next life. Yeah. I had a conversation about that with a Hare Krishna one time. It was really interesting. Okay. But anyway, um, uh, so yeah, but I, I think it does. It, it still worries me that these people can even say this stuff, even if they don't really mean it, because I think. Um, if if you look at uh, if you look at the work with the work of uh, many of the great psychologists of the twentieth century, they talk about um, stages that we all go through uh, on our way to to maturity. And I am going to have to look up a term here. The six stages of moral development is one term that's often used. Um, so when you're a child, you are completely self-centered, and that, that, I don't say that in a bad way. You know, I have a two and a half year old son he's completely self-centered and he should be because he's two and a half mm. but uh, <laughs> um, it's if you're 22 and a half that you have to worry <laughs> exactly there's there's stages in which we develop morally from from a completely self-centered point of view to a, i suppose you could say a community point of view yeah um but you can track the stages by by the way people react to the world and especially in terms of their empathy with others yeah? and if people don't if people people should pass through these stages and reach the, they've they've identified six stages in the, in the world of psychology perhaps there are really eight perhaps there are really four it doesn't matter um, but you you should progress through these stages and and when you've you've done that you've you've achieved one important aspect of being a mature adult but not everybody gets there uh, because not everybody develops the degree of empathy to another person which tells them that everybody else is as real as they are. So everybody has an inner life that's as real as your inner life. Uh, when, when a bad thing happens to another person, it's as terrible for that person as it would be if it happened to you, that kind of stuff. Pe- some people just never get to that point. Yeah? And in extreme circumstances, uh, we call these people psychopaths. This is a, a central, uh, a central aspect of, being, of, of psychopathy. Um, now, I think that any ideology which encourages you to uh, to see the world in terms of, okay, I can change the world if I just think positively, um, the external world will, will, will bend to my will, it will bring good things to me if I approach it the right way, is a little bit uh, psychopathic because that doesn't treat the external world as being as real as it is and that's a problem that psychopaths have they don't see the world outside them outside themselves as as being as real as the world inside themselves i think it depends how you interpret it i mean if you think back to um sci-fi movies um a hundred years ago sorry or, or say 60 years ago 
um, a lot of the things that were people thought about and thought about the future, they've, they've become, they've, they've, they've actually happened. They've, they've manifested them, uh, it, it basically to use it, to use a term that's often used, um, in the positive thinking move about manifestation. Mm -hmm. You could say that, that, that if you thought about it in that way, that, that what people imagine eventually does happen, you could see that there's something in it by, if you think about it in that way. I think that's a slightly different process, though. That's that's a process of, of prediction, of looking at the direction things are going in, um, factoring in different things that uh, that might cause it to go in a different direction, and trying to guess where we'll we'll be. Uh, and, and I, I, I don't look at it. I don't look at it like that. I look at it as, um, and I think that that's one way of looking at it, and and that does happen too. But I'm not talking mm -hmm. about prediction. I'm talking about how people often see what people have imagined and then try to make it. So I'm saying basically when, uh, when people, uh -huh. when people had views about the future, they weren't, when they weren't predicting, they were saying, Oh, we could, we could have these phones. They weren't looking at technology that existed because there was nothing like it. They were basically sort of saying, Oh, wouldn't it be cool if we had these? And then the tech, the people who progressed in technology over the years thought, wouldn't it be great if we made a little thing like a flip phone that you can, they can ask it any question and, uh, and it will give us the answer and, and Google and, and some other companies are developing instruments now where you can just talk to them and, and they'll, you know, ask it a question and it will tap into Google and it will come out with the answer. And it's all, you know, it's th sometimes things are created out of people's what people imagined in the past. So it's not prediction. It's creating things from people's uh, previous imaginations. Yeah, I agree with that, though. Anybody who anybody who grew up with uh, the sci fi uh, TV series and and cartoons of the 70s and 80s, I think is still got to be asking themselves, where are the flying cars? <laughs> uh -huh. I can I can show you the uh, I can show you a photo of the first production line flying car that's coming out. Um, really? Yeah. Jeez. I actually tweeted it. Um, I, I, I'm, a, I'm embarrassed to say I'm actually a tweeter now because uh, <laughs> when you run a channel like this, it, it does it is very useful to, to uh, set up a Twitter channel. But I tweeted a picture of uh, the world's first production line flying car that's coming out next year. Um, so I can uh, I, maybe I'll put a photo of it uh, in this episode so people can look at it. All right. So, um, yeah, about positive thinking. I, I again, I, I, I just want to, you know, sum up and say, uh, I, I'm not saying that uh, we shouldn't think positively, that we shouldn't think optimistically, and 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 dream of uh, of um, you know how things could turn out well, and 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 aim for that. And and in fact, I think uh, people who lack any concept of where they might like to be, you know, like next week, next year, five years' time, whatever, um, perhaps have a, have a more difficult time in, 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 in directing themselves and making decisions and so on. But I think uh, when it develops into an ideology and when this ideology um, tells you that, that, that thinking positively is going to, A, cause the external world to, to, to melt and become part of you uh, and, and pliant to your will, uh, or B, that... that you know, anyone who's not thinking positively is is doing themselves a disservice and 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 kind of you know deserves the misfortune that 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 results. Uh, then it becomes then it becomes a dogma, and and, and then I, I I really don't like it. So so people who have a positive outlook on life, fine. People involved in this positive thinking movement, I'm worried for those people. Yeah. See, I I I think you're talking about such a small part of that positive thinking group that um, I would disagree to a certain extent but let me give you a, let me say a few things about positive thinking and tell me if you disagree or agree so we're, we're sure. sort of more clear so mm -hmm. um, here's a few statements for you um, positive thinking uh, people who think positively are the, often the kind of people that other people want to be around it gives them more friends more opportunities and a wider range of pos possibilities to explore what would you say about that um, I, I can see it. I can see it. I, I think uh, I can't help but but think. Uh, so I just started a, a working at a new university, and I got a colleague uh, here, and a, a fellow Australian uh, called Murray Louise, who has a very cynical, dark sense of humour, and that uh, at first she's her her cynical sort of dark take on things 
made everybody a little bit suspicious of her. And I, and I think that uh, she perhaps struggled a little bit in the first week, was perhaps a bit misunderstood. But, but as time has gone on and, and, and uh, people have gotten to know her a little bit more, that, that kind of dark humour, the twist that she manages to put on things, has made her a very attractive person for the group, the group of us who've all started this job at the same time. So, so I think it can go either way. It depends on circumstances and the situation. Um, don't you think that's because of the positive thinking people around her who've got taken the time to get to know her and thought, no, she's OK, let's get let's spend more time with her. If they'd been negative thinking people around, they'd be like, what a miserable um, woman. Let's not I won't hang out with her anymore. So the maybe, positive, maybe. positive thinking has has actually created a, good, a positive situation. there. Maybe. And, and to be fair, she's not miserable. She's just, you know, like she's got she she employs cynical humor. That's quite a different thing to being miserable. <laughs> Okay, let's continue anyway. Um, positive uh, thinking people, it's not necessarily that their lives are better, um, although they, but they do sometimes seem to attract positive events and people uh, because if something negative happens, they don't dwell on it. They get up, deal with it, move on. A negative thinking person could make more of a deal about um, a negative situation. Um, whereas a positive thinking person would... There's an, there's an old famous phrase, when life hands you lemons... <laughs> make lemonade surely uh, that's that's such a it's, it's it's a nice way of thinking when life hands you lemons make lemonade it has its limits uh i heard an israeli person say last week when life hands you gaza make limonaza <laughs> what's that supposed to mean <laughs> I yeah um I I think I I I think it's it, again it's about it's about the spectrum it's true up to a point I would say okay okay mm. um here's here's some more things about negative thinking people um negative thinking people can suck the positive energy out of the people around them I mean I've I've experienced that myself there are some very negative thinking people who need who need people around them to keep firing positives at them because they think they think negatively, but they actually do eventually achieve a positive result. I have met people like that. I, um, they've come to me and said certain things, I've, and I've tried to be positive with them. They've said something negative back, and eventually they've achieved the goal that they were trying to achieve, and they've almost used me as a like a, a stepping ladder to get get there. And then they've just walked away, like you know, great, look what I've done when. It's actually the people around them that have helped them get there. So that actually can be quite draining. So negative think that's, that's a negative about negative thinking. So surely positive thinking people actually are less selfish and more considerate to those people around them. Um, positive thinking and negative thinking are both contagious. <coughs> so if, if, if they are contagious, surely you want uh, positive thinking to be the contagion, you know? Um, again, I, I, I agree to an extent, but I mean, you've just said yourself that you've, you've been around uh, people whose thoughts are quite negative and you've been motivated to try to turn those around. And that can happen and sometimes it can leave you feeling used, uh, but sometimes I think it can also leave you feeling like you you actually helped somebody and and that's part of empathy which is... I, i'm not really talking about that uh, the, i'm not really talking about someone who needed help uh, i'm talking about someone who do this uh regularly <laughs> who, uh -huh. who use this as a way of achieving their goals uh mm -hmm. who are actually quite successful people so in some ways they're doing what you they're doing what you suggested which is just to be realistic and think uh, accept that it's a negative situation but they're using other people around them to constantly achieve success i'm not talking about people who are sad who uh, you know i'd always like to help or people who have clinical depression I'm not talking about those people i'm talking about people negative thinking people who rely on positive thinking people to get to make them become successful I mean, I think there's also another another uh, case that's possible, and I and I think I perhaps fall into this category myself with in in some of the things that I do in life that I undertake, uh, which is that you you have an idea of something you want to do. It's a bit of a crazy idea, and you think, well, it's it'll probably never work, but I really want to try. Uh, you know, chances are I'm going to end up looking like an idiot. 
But hey, let's see and let's let's try it and see what happens. So if you say chances are I'm going to end up looking like an idiot, and there's a positive thinking person around, they're going to slap you. But I, I don't think that's a that's a necessarily a terrible thing a way to go about something. Is is I, like, I think that's... it might it, it might fail, but let's try. That's that's perfectly normal and and fine to do. But in yeah. some ways, that's a positive that's a positive way of thinking. It's not really negative. Um, I mean, I'll give you an example. If a guy's in a bar, he sees an attractive girl. Um, if he visualizes a successful outcome, he's more likely to uh, he's more likely to approach her uh, as a positive thinker than a negative thinker who would sit there thinking there's no point, she's not going to like me, you know. So um, you know, positive thinking and visualization can work in that way. But I think you're right that y you need to accept that it's not always going to work. You know, she might slap you around the face. <laughs> Yeah, and I think you've possibly come come up with the uh, the the ultimate situation there by which to test any philosophy is okay. Girl in a bar more attractive than you. Tell me, philosophers, <laughs> what's your take? What's your take on this situation? <laughs> exactly. I mean, and the idea of visualization is used in sports psychology quite a mm -hmm. lot. The idea of visualizing success, visualizing goals, and if it didn't work. There would be quite a lot of sports psychologists out of, out of a job, and I, I've got a feeling it probably does work to a certain extent. There must be something in it because people are being employed, getting paid lots of money. I know that's not in itself um, the end of everything, but I think there may be something in the visualization. It's definitely worth exploring. I don't think it's been proven not to work, and uh, and it may it may still be the jury's out on it, but. It's not where it's not. It wouldn't be such a bad thing to give it a chance. You know what I think my issue is here with this with with this whole area is that it, it is that in some of its incarnations it tends towards fundamentalism, and I have a problem with any kind of fundament, fundamentalism, uh, be it religious, ideological, even atheist fundamentalism, um, psychological fundamentalism, political, whatever. I very much doubt that your sports psychologists are not preparing their athletes for failure as well as for success. I very much doubt that. I, I, true, I, true. But we're talking, I think the key with positive things is you're, you do need to accept failure. It's how you deal with that failure. Uh, it's, um, you know, you get knocked down, you get back up again. But you've got yes. to have your eventual goal, your eventual goal. Uh, but you need to accept that you're, it's, it's not going to be easy. Anything, most of the things that are good in life, they don't just come easily. You need to accept that you're going to get knocked down and keep fighting. But you do need positive thinking to visualize that end goal. Um, I would agree, but I, I, I think there's a there's a difference. And if you if you look at um, if you look at athletes in their post match interviews when they when they lose, uh, they they will admit that 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 you know their defeat was bitter and and they should be allowed to do that they shouldn't go back to the dressing room and say no this and, and be told you know no this defeat is not bitter this defeat is a it's a it's a glorious defeat it's something that had to happen and happened for a reason it's part of your you know ascent to the top I, I, I i'll think tell you what if i was in a losing team and someone walked in uh, yeah. who was a member of the team a respected member of the team not someone just off the street Yep. I would actually, he'd be quite welcome in the changing room <laughs> because, you know, we'd all be sitting there, heads in our hands. And this guy uh -huh. walks in and says that, I'd actually, it would actually make me feel a bit better. Maybe, maybe, maybe that's down to personality. I, I, I could definitely see this. For some people, that's exactly what they need to hear. You know, this is a step along the way. This had to happen to us to teach us a lesson. Da, 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 da. That's fine. Um, may, for, for me personally, I think I'd prefer to hear wow, that really sucked. Let's start back at the beginning and next time we'll know what we did wrong. That's and positive we'll thinking though. What you're saying it's, there is exactly positive thinking. But it's a mix. It's it's not so fundamental, fundamentalist. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. fair enough. Let me just I, see I, if we've covered... I, um, I, I want to say about sporting events. I mean, you do sometimes see... I, I know you hate football, Anthony, but I'm, I'm going to go there, <laughs> sorry. You do sometimes, sometimes see a football team and they're doing uh -huh. quite badly... At half time, you know, it's uh, a football match is 90 minutes long. Half time, they're doing badly, and you, I've seen some teams they react very badly to that that negative situation, and mm -hmm. they go on to lose. And I've seen yep. other teams that think, no, we can do this, we can overcome this insurmountable mountain, and they go on to win. Mm -hmm. um, 
Liverpool Champions League that it happened there there was a big uh, there was a, a famous case where they were losing 3-0 I think and they eventually won 4-3 so mm -hmm. it does work if people believe that something could happen they, you have to believe you have to believe otherwise there's no way it's going to happen if you believe you're, you're definitely going to lose how, how's that going to help you but again, you, I mean, it's, it's a spectrum. And, and I would point out in, in terms of football, I think we were both in Kazakhstan when, when Kazakhstan played Portugal, right? In, in yeah. Almaty. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the Kazakh team lost. And everybody in the crowd knew that the Kazakh team were going to lose. Um, it's obvious they're playing Portugal, right? Mm -hmm. But nobody, and nobody in the stadium was, was thinking, or in the team, was thinking... If we just stay positive, we're going to win. Nobody thought that. Uh, on the other hand, nobody. Took I bet. The I bet there was a couple of people in the team who right, who, who might have entertained <laughs> who might have entertained the idea <gasps> that they could win. And I and I bet you. I, I think the key with positive thinking is that it can it can almost create a miracle because I bet you if all eleven players had the crazy idea that they could win, I'm not saying that they would win. But I'm saying there would be more of a chance that they could win than if they didn't think that. So I think what you do with positive thinking is you increase your odds. See, I really liked the attitude that, that seemed to be prevalent, although I'm not a football fan. I, I liked the attitude that seemed to be prevalent uh, in that match, which, which was, OK, first of all, we, got, we, we were beaten by Portugal, but we were beaten 2-1. That's amazing. <laughs> Sorry, That's you, not cut, positive you cut out thinking. again there, the last four, uh, four words. OK. So, so the attitude was, all right, Portugal beat us, but they beat us 2-1. We all expected 6-1, <laughs> which is not positive thinking at all. If well, you're in some ways somebody... it is. In some ways but, it is. It's like, they... wow, look at what we've done here. Yeah, yeah. So in some but, ways it is positive thinking. In some ways, yeah. But, but uh, the attitude was, um, you know, um, doesn't matter. You know, we, we still we love our guys, though they lost. Um, we knew they were going to lose. And, and, you know, it was a wonderful experience to see them playing Portugal. And that's it. No, like, you can do it, you can do it. No, sorry, you can't do it. You're, you're up against the Portugal team. <laughs> it's, just, it's not going to happen, you know. Um, of course, play hard. Do your best. Be there, present in the moment, in every moment, and just do whatever you can. And um, be proud of what you've done even though the result is a loss. Um, yeah, I, I think that situation you've described there is the goal is not to win, though, is it? Um, if, if you have that attitude, it's like nobody nobody there cares enough to win. So it's good. It's good in a way. Yeah, it's great. It's a great way of dealing with a situation. But it's obviously a situation. It's not that an important situation, is it? No, and and you know it's 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 thinking realistically. I mean, fortunes change, you no, know, and 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 in the world of football. Well, I don't know much about the world of football, so let's change this to tennis. <laughs> um, in the world of tennis, there are plenty of people who say, like early in their career, went out to face a, a, a great player, never had any expectation of winning, but but thought, I'm going to give this my best shot. I'm going to play the best match I've ever played. I'm still going to lose, but I'm going to be proud, right? How, and do, you, how do you know they didn't think they could win? Because they'll, they'll tell you that. No, nobody's, no 16-year-old who's been given a wild card into a Grand Slam tournament is going to seriously think that they can beat Roger Federer at the uh, height I, of his I, I, I would disagree. I would say, I, would say I, I don't know. I mean, we'd have to obviously check this, but someone like Boris Becker, I, 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 reckon, you're, I reckon that everyone around them i think you'd you'd be right that everyone around them gave them would have given them no hope but i reckon some of these people who break through actually did believe that they could do it you can see uh and god i can't believe we're talking about sport but but uh you can see these guys sometimes they're they're young guys they go up against a really established player let's say federer nadal djokovic whatever <clears throat> they win one set in the match and they're thrilled. They can't believe it. They're so happy. Mm -hmm. And for them, that's a victory. They, they, um, that, that's positive thinking to the right extent. It's like, well, I was never going to beat this guy, but look what I did, you know. And some of those guys go on to then later be in a situation where they do have a realistic chance. But you've got to keep it realistic. You've got to say, all right, I'm not ready now, but I'm going to learn from this and maybe I'll get, you know, get, a, few, get a few swings in. And then, and then maybe another time I'll be in a better position. That's still that, positive that's, thinking. Yeah, but it's it's tempered by realism. That's my problem with the positive thinking movement per se is that they don't temper it with any realism. So, so I'm saying, 
be optimistic, but don't allow your allow your thoughts to get to get uh, carried away because that's not going to help you at all. Um, yeah, I, see, I would I would still disagree to a certain extent. I would say get carried away to a certain extent, <laughs> and but but maybe I mean it in a different way to what you're thinking because. I'm sort of saying dare to dream. You know, it's like I think I had a picture on the wall when I was younger that said um, aim for the moon or something, you know, like we had an astronaut on the moon. It was like, don't aim for, you know, something small, aim for something big. It's good to because, you know, and you, you could if you really do believe in, in a lot of occasions, you will get there. But you, you do have to be there has to be some uh, realism about it. I mean, I'm not going to be. A professional footballer in the Premier League in the uh -huh. UK at the moment, because based on I'm too old, it's it's not phys physiologically possible. Um, so you have to be re realistic with your goal to a certain extent. But I still think you could dream. But Scott, you, Scott, you're falling prey to negative thoughts. Um, no, <laughs> no, I'm not because <laughs> there's impossible and there's what I what I do like people to think about is that what other people think is impossible is a lot to do with negative thinking if it's actually physiologically possible then mm. there's a possibility it could be done uh -huh. if it's physiologically impossible like me playing the premier league is i i could maybe train every day for the next five years i'm going to be uh, actually i don't want to give my age away i'm going to be old um so i would say <laughs> it's physiologically impossible because of the high standards of the premier league in, scott, in the uk scott mm -hmm. um i haven't received that invitation to your 21st yet by the way oh thanks for that anthony yeah i'll uh, i'll send it soon <laughs> um anyway i wanted to say about um visualization again um i think the key is to be less specific about what you're visualizing for example mm -hmm. if you imagine yourself being happy in the future living in a place by the sea with someone you love and in contentment that could be possible but if you imagine that you'll be li living in italy in on a specific date on a in a by a specific lake with a specific person doing a specific job uh, and working for a specific company that's where i think positive thinking and visualizations may not be possible you're being too specific you know you, you you've got to let uh, the reality around you have a chance you know I, yeah, that's an interesting point, and we're, and and it's it's taking me off topic again because I was talking uh, yesterday with a person who is into the Wiccan ideology, and uh, she says, as many of her fellow Wiccans does, that the that the the best intention spells go awry because people are not specific enough. Uh, uh, that if you imagine wealth and success and so forth. You, you're never going to get it. You need to be more specific. You need to have something in mind, a place that that that, that, that you want to be or a thing you, you want, because if you don't have that, you don't have the focus and the magic is never going to work, it, which which right. is a very, inter it's a very interesting question because I can see both sides of this. Well, absolutely. I can see that. But I think the key thing is time. Don't be specific about time mm -hmm. uh, because you know that things might happen you know you can't you don't have control over everything around you i don't i wouldn't go that far but you i think you can influence events around you to a certain extent mm -hmm. how far that goes i don't know but i would still keep an open mind that it might be possible i mean we live like you like we started off this conversation we live in a crazy world how crazy is it i mean i've i have heard people sort of saying and this connects to the uh, the kind of movement you're talking about Mm -hmm. um i have heard situations where you know say something bad happens like uh say you're in a shop and someone walks in and uh, they they pull out a gun and shoot someone i have heard some people say well you actually created that situation somehow yeah. some way i've now, heard that too and that's where i get off the positive thinking roundabout i just i i cannot accept that right i don't what i would say about that is as like I just said, we started this conversation. We live in a very crazy world. How crazy is it? I don't know. I don't. I don't think it's that crazy, but I keep an open mind because um, I don't really know for sure. To be honest, you know, I, I'd like to entertain the idea because wouldn't it be great if we could create situations around us? You know, I think it. What I'm saying is, it's worth an experiment. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, if you sat there and you re um, you you really wanted to have a certain situation in the future. 
and you sat there and, and you believed that you could perhaps make it happen using this philosophy, it'd be nice to give it a try. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not no. sure you're convinced. Of, oh, you didn't sound very no, no. convincing with your. No, no, no. I was, just, I was just thinking about <laughs> what to say next. You're thinking about what you're going to buy down the shops tomorrow. Yeah, in this bizarre debate about about psychology, sport, and 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 being shot in a public place. <laughs> um, I, I wanted to leave you with two quotes, Anthony, and um, uh -huh. I mean, uh, you can. I, I just wanted your comments. I mean, after this quote, the, the first one is by Stephen King. Mm -hmm. Um, this was on writers for any uh, would-be writers out there. And, yep. you know, I, I guess a lot of these successful people are often approached by people, you know, how do I motivate myself to do this? How do I become successful? So a lot of these famous people often give quotes like this. This is from Stephen King for would-be authors out there. Mm -hmm. And his quote was, you can, you should, and if you're brave enough to start, you will. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and your, uh, your reaction to that, Anthony? Uh, I'm surprised that he said that because he should know more than anyone that the publishing industry is brutal, especially now, um, because the publishing industry is is in danger of collapse uh, due to you know various electronic formats. Uh, yeah, negative but, thinking, Anthony. Negative thinking. <laughs> I know. Um, I know. Sorry, uh, I'm going to give you another quote now. Mm -hmm. Abraham Lincoln. We can complain because rose bushes have thorns. Or rejoice because thorn bushes have roses. <laughs> mm. um, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's 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 glass half full thinking, I suppose, which is fine. That's completely fine. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I, I I think we're actually probably our opinions on this. I think are, are, are in fact very close. Uh, my my objection comes from people trying to make money. Uh, out of exploiting the natural optimism of others, that's that's my main objection. And and the other things that I, I mentioned early on was uh, people not having the sensitivity to realise the difference because they're so they're so invested in making money, they don't have the sensitivity to 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 make the distinction between someone who comes to them and says uh, I want to be successful because that's a natural uh, desire of many people to be successful in their life versus someone who comes to them who has serious psychological problems and they say oh I can fix those we just have to think positively I, I don't uh, my objection comes when you you solidify something into an ideal a, a kind of one-size-fits-all ideology when it's clearly it, it's clearly not going to work for everyone and and it, it clearly can in some cases tend to extremes that are un, that are unpleasant. Okay, uh, well, I'm afraid I'm going to have to agree with you on, on everything you just said there. Excellent. <laughs> um, okay, I'm going to leave you with one final phrase, which is quite famous. And if you could change this phrase to, this is a little bit of a challenge for you, and I'll give you a bit of time. <laughs> if you could change this phrase to reflect a bit more about um, the way you think about positive thinking, See if you can change this very famous phrase. And it's Nike, just do it. <laughs> what would a what would someone from your uh, philosophy about caution about uh, about positive thinking say about that phrase? What would you add to the end of that? Just do it. Just do it, but just do it, but be prepared for anything. Okay, that's good. I, I think that's good, yeah. Um uh, yeah, just do it, but be prepared for obstacles maybe as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. I think we've probably covered it there. So uh, anything else you want to add, wanted to add? No, no. Okay, well, thanks very much for joining us uh, today, Anthony. It's been nice to hear you again. And I hope you'll you'll come back on again soon. We, we, you know, we've got so many topics we'd like to talk about. Oh, we really, really do. Yeah, yeah. There's a, there's a huge backlog. Um, yeah, it was fun. Thank you very much. Okay, we'll be in touch soon because uh, I think you should come on a bit more often if you can. Yeah, yeah, and I've been enjoying the show and uh, I love the T-shirt. Yes, thanks for the plug there. If you do <laughs> like a T-shirt. Okay, thanks a lot, Anthony. See you later. All right, see you. Okay, bye. So I sort of agree with Anthony on some of his points. and it, There is a danger that we deny that we're feeling bad and that things need addressing, but, um, you know, at the end of the day, I still believe... 
there's a lot to be said for positive thinking in general, not the actual positive thinking movement so much, but just just thinking positive. We need to have hope um, for the future and, and but also positive action at the same time. Remember, blind belief in authority is the greatest enemy of truth, Albert Einstein. Please help donate. Please uh, donate £28 to get a t-shirt. We've also teamed up with a t-shirt company. I'll put the adverts up. Remember, uh, the t-shirts that I um, provide and the t-shirt company, two separate entities. But um, if you do buy a t-shirt with the company that advertising on this show, which are basically um, trutht-shirts.com, then they donate uh, £2.50 to the show and you get 10% discount using the code TRUTH1. Okay, so have a look at the adverts, use the code TRUTH1 to get your 10% discount and a donation will be sent to Truth Sentinel as well. And that's truthtshirts.com. Check out their website. So um, we're basically just uh, winding down the show now. Um, remember to have a good week. Remember to also contact us uh, on scottsentinel9 at gmail.com. Uh, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, just typing Truth Sentinel or Scott Sentinel. Um, contact us at scottsentinel9 at gmail.com. You can send us voicemails to be included on in the show. You can also contact us on Skype, Scott Sentinel 9. Now, that's also another way you can send a voicemail. So if you leave a voicemail on, um, on Skype, I can hear it, but I can't actually put it on the show because I haven't found a way of saving the files actually from Skype. Uh, they make it really difficult to do that. So if you want your voicemail actually on the show, then do it via the um, feature I've added. If you just want to say hello, um, call. Uh, you can leave a voicemail on Skype. If you actually want to chat to me on Skype, send me a message with a time and a day, and I'll try and be there. And you can, and then I can record you, and you can be on the show, and we can have a longer conversation because the voicemail feature is only one and a half minutes. Also, if you'd like to come on as a guest, please contact me as well. Topics coming up in future episodes could include Fukushima, Chernobyl, missing persons, time travel, Dyatlov Pass incident, religious cults such as Scientology. Uh, we'll talk about anarchy, uh, parallel universes, the control of scientific fact, utopia, Noah's Ark and the, and the worldwide flood, revolution. Um, other shows that we listen to, Hagman and Hagman, Freeman Fly, Mark Cocking, John Gary, David Icke, Pete Wicker, Sheila Zielinski, of course, um, Alex Jones. Um, there's lots of shows out there. Um, they're some of the ones that I listen to. There's lots of others as well. Anyone who wishes to advertise or sponsor our channel, please contact us, scottsentinel9 at gmail.com. Thanks once again for listening. Hope you have a great week. Catch you later. Goodbye.